Comforter, Spirit of Truth, art everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasury of good things and giver of life. Come and dwell within us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, on a Thursday. It feels like a Friday. I just had to check my phone and it's a Thursday. And I also feel like I'm really orange right now on camera. I don't know if it's just my my computer screen right now or or if it's the color of my shirt messing with the camera setting. I don't know. I feel like I'm really, really orange right now. <laughs> so it's throwing me off. <laughs> Anyways, I wanted to um, offer a brief response here to a video that uh, Classical Theist posted responding to Michael Lofton on the Magisterium. So um, yesterday I mentioned that I probably wouldn't do a review commenting on it because I pulled up a random spot and it sounded to me like they were misrepresenting me. Um, but then several supporters said, no, 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 I, I think that there's a misunderstanding here. They weren't intentionally trying to misrepresent you or anything like that. Classical Theist also commented yesterday and said, you know, that um, there's a misunderstanding. So I said, okay, that, that's fine. Maybe maybe I misunderstood. Uh, so I apologize if I if I misunderstood Classical Theist or I think his name is Terillion, uh, who's, who's in the video. So I apologize for that. I went back and listened. And yeah, I think that there is a misunderstanding of my view. But I, you know, I'm assuming that there's no um, intention to misunderstand it. I don't have any reason to believe that there's any kind of uh, intention on part of classical theists to misunderstand anything that I've said. It's probably due to the fact that I think my view is very, very qualified. And I've I've expressed it in many, many videos. So I finally kind of got to the point that I stopped giving all caveats every episode <laughs> on my view just because I kind of expect people to already um, know my view. But then again, I understand that there's people who are new to the channel or may only see one of my videos and could misunderstand my perspective on the magisterium. That's that's fair. Um, but after a while, I kind of get tired of, of giving all the necessary qualifiers for my view on a particular subject. So sometimes I just kind of give a general uh, view. So I'm sure if there's a, well, there is a misunderstanding on what my view is, but I'm sure it's probably due to me not giving enough qualifications in the video that's being reviewed. Because again, I kind of feel like I'm I'm exhausted giving all the necessary qualifiers. I just kind of have to assume that uh, people are familiar. And, and so those people who are already familiar with my views said, yeah, here's where classical theist was misunderstanding you. Um, so I went back and watched and I saw, yeah, okay, I, I see where they're misunderstanding my perspective. And if, if my perspective were what classical theist uh, thinks it is, I would agree with him that it would be a problematic perspective, but, but uh, fortunately it's not. So <laughs> we're going to review that. Um, I'm, so I'm going to just review probably the first six minutes of the video um, where they give an introduction because that's where they lay out how they understand my view. And I'm going to demonstrate that that's not my view. So the rest of the video, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to review just because um, it's kind of, it's that, it's that quote from Aquinas. Uh, a small mistake in the beginning is a big one in the end, you know, from his uh, De Ente et Essentia, where he talks about how, you know, one, one small issue at the beginning leads to other uh, issues later on, bigger issues. And so there's already a misunderstanding of my perspective at the very beginning. So any further commentary on it is I don't need to respond to just because it's not going to be interacting with my actual view. Um, and, and again, I don't, I don't believe that classical theist is trying to misunderstand anything. Again, it's probably due to the fact that, um, my view is pretty qualified and in every video, I just don't give every single qualification to it. So I could see how somebody would misunderstand it. 
Um, but that's what I want. What I want to try to do today is clarify my perspective. Now, my view has has developed uh, over the last few years, but but my view was never what classical theist thinks it is. So it, it's not like if one pulled up like an old video before some of the tweaking of my perspective. Um, that it would have led them to that view because even even then i don't think i've ever held to the way they've interpreted me um so again i'm going to review from around the six minute 10 second mark until around the 12 minute mark and i think that that will clear up um all you know all misunderstandings at that point point. and by the way I, I did see that classical theist is in the chat and he, he was uh very sincere in, in indicating that he did not you know intend to misunderstand me and i i um and um and and i'm sure we can do a, a video discussion um in the future talking about you know any any other points that need to be clarified in the future so i'll, I'll get with him off the air and see if i can get him here on reason and theology and we can just talk um about any other points that need to be clarified all right so let's start at the like i said around six minute uh, 11 second mark. Let me share my screen. And you should be able to see it now. And let me know if there's any difficulty in hearing it. Uh, I think he's way too overzealous now against uh, this group of Catholics. And I think it's led him into some thinking that is honestly pretty problematic, especially in light of this current uh, papacy and in light of. Well, I wouldn't say that I'm overzealous um, in pointing out problems with some of the radical traditionalists. I think that what it is, is there's not enough people engaging the radical traditionalists, some of their perspectives that I think do damage to the church. Because what I'm hearing from radical traditionalists is that they're a solution to the current crisis in the church. What they're presenting is a solution to liberalism and all the issues that we have in the church with bad clergy and um, ambiguous teachings and all, all kinds of things like that. So um, the way they present themselves is they're the ones who are teaching the traditional Catholic faith, and this is the solution to the current crisis. And I just don't hear enough people engaging um, the radical traditionalists and pointing out that some of the things that they propose does more harm to the church than it does good. So I wouldn't say I'm overzealous. What it is, is I'm trying to fill in a gap. But you'll also notice that I spend plenty of time dealing with Protestants and also with Eastern Orthodox. So it's not just one particular group that I'm just overzealous to criticize or something like that. What it is, is I'm trying to across the board address various problems that i see in the apologetic scene today so i don't i don't agree that i'm just overzealous here current christ i think it comes off as very tone deaf his uh... now as far as tone deaf i, I didn't really appreciate that I, I think that that's a straw man um i i don't think that anybody could honestly say that i'm being tone deaf i recognize that there are problems in the church and I'm willing to acknowledge any time that there's a problem with Pope Francis or anyone else. Um, the problem is a lot of the criticisms that we hear are not actually legitimate criticisms of Pope Francis. So I will respond and point that out, and somebody might perceive that as me being tone deaf, but I have plenty of videos where I have charitably criticized Pope Francis. Just yesterday, I did a video charitably criticizing the Flemish bishops um, and also offered some criticism of Pope Francis in that. So I'm willing to criticize, um, you know, members of the clergy when it's necessary. But the point is, I want to, number one, do so charitably because I have failed to be charitable many times in my criticisms of Pope Francis or a member of the clergy. And, and that's, all the more egregious because they are um, authentic teachers of the faith. That is, individuals who have apostolic succession and the ability to teach with authority from Christ. And so um, I think that, you know, we need to be a little bit more cognizant of the office that they hold. And so that's why I, I try to be a little bit more reserved and more charitable and give the benefit of the doubt. If you think that's tone deaf, so be it. I would rather end up being on the side of being tone deaf 
than sin against um, somebody by rashly judging them, especially when they're a member of the magisterium. Uh, but again, I, I don't think it's tone deaf. So I, I don't really know where where classical theus is coming from here, but I know that that's the way I'm portrayed in radical traditionalist circles. Um, but I don't think that that's actually being fair to my actual perspective. Um, disposition toward traditional Catholicism generally. Um, he seems to be moving almost in a where Peter is kind of direction. Not quite. I mean, he's much less insufferable. But. So the, uh, I guess this Terillian guy is saying, I seem to be moving in more of a where Peter is direction. I don't really read where Peter is or watch anything. You know, I've I've talked to Pedro before um, and, and Mike before. And in fact, I think I'm going to have Mike on tomorrow where we're going to talk about some of the areas we disagree with, or, you know, with each other and areas where we agree with each other. Because I, I don't really know exactly what Mike's view is on some things. I think I think I would probably differ with him somewhat uh, when it comes to the issue of Father James Martin. So that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. And, you know, I'll give him an opportunity to explain in any areas where maybe I've misunderstood him. Um, so I don't really know what where Peter is perspective is, but I know how they're portrayed by radical traditionalists. And they tend to portray the where Peter is crowd as um, never willing to criticize the Pope or admit when there's a problem. And now, I can't speak for where Peter is and say if that's accurate or not. Maybe that's accurate, maybe that's not. I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to speak on their behalf. They can defend themselves, and they can speak for themselves. All I can do is say that if that is what is meant by I'm moving more in that direction, I, I would say that's a straw man. Um, because again, I have been very clear um, as far as I'm not going to bash the Pope, but I'm also not going to bury my head in the sand and ignore a problem when there is a problem. The issue is a lot of the criticisms that people present aren't actual criticisms that really could be leveled against the Pope. That's my problem. That's not being tone deaf. That's not going to a position that I just am unwilling to recognize problems in the church. So, I, again, I don't know exactly what is meant here, but I don't think that that's really accurate and represents my view. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I would characterize it as well. I, I think that, um, I, I do think that he, uh, I think where Peter is is almost the logical conclusion to where he's starting to get at, you know? Um, and you'll see that in this video. You'll see that I really wanted to address this stream. And so he says the where Peter is group, again, whatever their position is, is, is the logical conclusion to what my position is. But then, as I'm going to demonstrate, classical theist misunderstands my position. So I'm going to then say, well, wait, if you misunderstood my position, um, you're wrong whenever you conclude that this is the logical progression of my view, because that's not actually my view. And I've already accounted for what is being said here. Um, believe it or not, I've actually put some thought into this stuff. And and have asked the question, okay, where, where does this stuff lead? In fact, that's kind of what I've known I'm known for doing is asking, okay, what's the logical conclusion of this perspective? I mean, how many times those of y'all who watch the show, how many times do y'all see me saying things like that? I mean, I'm always taking perspectives and I'm saying, here's the logical conclusion to that. Obviously, I've done the same thing with my own perspective. That he did because he he, I think this is where you'll we'll see his most recent and most refined articulation of where he's at when it comes to um, the circumstances under which a Catholic might uh, withhold his assent to like a problematic magisterial teaching. No, no, and and I have to assume this is because maybe classical theist hasn't really watched a lot of my content. I don't know um, because the video that they're talking about is the one where I'm responding to. Timothy Gordon. That is not the most extensive video where I've outlined my view by any means. Um, I know they made fun of how long it is, but I it, it's just because I was addressing a pretty long, you know, uh, or not a long segment, but a segment that was packed with a lot of points that needed to be addressed. But um, this is the video that I'm pointing to is just a shorthand video explaining um, my perspective. I've I've outlined my video, number one, in, in a 
the course that I offer on the Magisterium, but also the Magisterium playlist, where I go over all kinds of details related to the Magisterium. And once you've maybe watched that, you'll you'll kind of then see what my view is. Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever just done one video saying, here's my view from A to Z. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't really think so. I know, I've again, I've done multiple videos where I've laid out, you know, bits and pieces of it. And I've also done many videos where I give a lot of qualifications and do a lot of explanation. But I, I don't know if there is a video that I've done in A to Z. I mean, I have over a thousand videos in in three years. And so it's a, it's a little hard to remember <laughs> what, what all I've I've said so again. This is I'm giving classical theists the benefit of the doubt. It's probably the case that I probably just haven't, you know, laid it all out in this video or just laid it all out in one video that one person can go to. And so that's why people who have watched my magisterium playlist, they're like, okay, they're misunderstanding your your perspective. They're confusing this with that. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, I, I, I could see maybe how somebody would would have a misunderstanding there. So m maybe it just means that I need to do an A to Z video or something like that. <laughs> but that's kind of what I consider my magisterium course, you know? I mean, how can you really lay some of this stuff out in just one video? I'll, again, I'll try to give just a brief uh, synopsis of what my perspective is in relation to what's about to be addressed. But obviously, we could tease that out, you know, a whole lot more. I could tease it out in way more detail. And I'm, and I'm not literally going to address every single um, uh, uh, objection in one video. Okay. Let's continue. And as you know, as all of you know, this is this specific question is something that I've devoted a lot of attention to recently because I think that this is really going to become the perennial question for, it, it, rather, it's going to become one of the most pertinent questions for a Catholic. Uh, I, and and he's here talking about the the question of the non-definitive magisterium or the merely authentic magisterium, and um, you know, to to what degree can it err? Um, yeah, I think that I think as I've already explained in previous videos, I think that is one of the issues. Um, the most hot, what, what's the word I'm looking for? The most pressing issue today, because of Pope Francis, especially, um, probably more just kind of in the post conciliar era, but especially because of Pope Francis, he is pushing the envelope in some areas. And because of that, the magisterium, as I've already noted, is going to have to outline itself that much more clearly. I think it already has kind of in seed form. So the perspective that I maintain, it's already there in a nutshell. But I want to see the magisterium further unpack that more clearly in light of the current pontificate, because I do think that Pope Francis is pushing the envelope when it comes to the merely authentic magisterium and is forcing us to ask these kinds of questions. You know, to what extent can the Pope err in his magisterium? And when we, when I say magisterium here, I'm talking about in his universal magisterium. And when I say universal magisterium here, I'm not talking about in his definitive universal magisterium. I'm talking about in his merely authentic universal magisterium. Lest somebody misunderstand me there. I'm not talking about ex cathedra. I'm talking about in his universal capacity as the universal shepherd. However, teaching non-definitively, to what extent can air creep into that perspective, right? Um, we have to address that question because of the circumstances in the church today. I think just because of kind of the post-conciliar era, but especially because of Pope Francis. But really, this question started coming up whenever you had popes, as I've already mentioned in previous shows, when you already had popes who are, you know, writing encyclicals and putting out, you know, really long uh, encyclicals with all kinds of teachings. And then people were asking things like, okay, is this all definitive? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how does this work? Do I, do I assent to all of this? We had to start teasing out these questions. That's why you see in the last few hundred years, the question of the merely authentic magisterium being developed that much more because prior to then it wasn't really as, as pressing of a need. So 
especially in the last few hundred years, it's it's been more of a pressing issue. And I want to say definitely in light of the current pontificate, because I do think that Pope Francis pushes the envelope. Um, we're going to have to work through these issues more and more and more, even though, like I said, seed form, I think it's already there in the magisterium. Okay, let's continue. I don't think the state of the papacy is going to get much better in the near future. I think that uh, any day now, especially in light of the synod, uh, Francis might, might write something in his magisterium that, that may very well uh, contradict the definitive teaching of the church. See, I, I take a different view on the synod. I, I don't really think it's, it's going to be that um, as far as the post-synodal apostolic exhort exhortation. I don't think that it, he's really going to push the envelope uh, very far there. So I, I don't expect a whole lot of fireworks from it. Um, I do think that there will be people at the Synod who will say all kinds of crazy things. Um, but since it's uh, generally not going to be magisterial, um, it's, it's, it's um, at least right now canonically, um, a consultative body unless the Pope endows it with magisterial authority, which has never been done. Um, so... Unless he does that, you know, it's not really going to matter a whole lot what some of the bishops say. Um, it's ultimately going to matter what does the Pope promulgate in his post-apostolic uh, exhortation. And I don't think that it's going to be anything that um, you know, teaches heresy or anything like that. Uh, we'll see. But, I mean, I, I doubt it very seriously. Um, but that being said, I actually agree with classical theists here that I think that um, – we're going to have more challenges with the papacy in the future. As I've said, I've, I've already, I've been on record saying for several years now, and I'll continue to say that I think that the next pontificate is going to be rougher than the current one. Um, so I've just said, we really need to work through these, these issues now uh, because I've said again, enjoy Pope Francis while we have them, because I think it's going to be a rockier road, uh, you know, when they elect his successor. Um, but hey, I, I'd be happy to be wrong there. You know, I'd, I'd love to swallow my words on that. Sure. Be, I'd be I'd be thrilled to come on YouTube and say, hey, I was wrong. <laughs> we have Pope Pius the 13th now, and he's awesome. Yeah, I, I'd love to say that. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be wrong about that, but we'll see. Um, but I, I actually am in agreement here with classical theists on this point, though, that I, I do think that the papacy is going to be rougher in the future. It's possible. We have to be ready for that. And the position that Mike Lofton is staking, I think, uh, puts himself and would put a Catholic who adopts it in, in, in the most vulnerable position in terms of the security of, of his faith. And see, that that's incorrect. But, I, but that's due to classical theists misunderstanding my view. Um, if, if I had this misunderstanding or misunderstood view, then yeah, maybe it would lead to, to something problematic like that. But no, um, my view can readily say that things are going to become more difficult for the papacy. How, how is it that I can say that? Why can I say that? Well, I can say that because I've already accounted for the fact that it could be more difficult and that doesn't actually alter anything that I've said. Um, but let's continue. Uh, and you'll see why that is in in a minute. I'll, I'm going to start playing it in a minute, but just to kind of get into why I'm addressing this is because, you know, law... So here's my perspective according to classical theists. He's going to give a synopsis of my perspective. Actually, I think he, he does that more at the 10-minute mark, so I think we might be a minute or so away from it. It has, has become increasingly quite uh, popular. His brand has, built, it has been building and developing and uh, increasing in popularity rather quickly uh, for good reason. I think he's done a lot of great work, as I've said. Um, and, but I think that the position that he's, he's starting to articulate with respect to the magisterium, if, if too many people really start to buy into it, I think that they're almost going to uh, force themselves in an unnecessarily uh, vulnerable position, especially if uh, Francis gets a little bit don't, don't be no, but I would say the opposite of my perspective, the perspective that is being promoted right now, often by the radical traditionalists, is actually the dangerous view and is what is going to lead people away from the church, as we are currently seeing. As I've been saying, that is why you see people going Benevacantis, Sedevacantis, Eastern Orthodox, and elsewhere. That is why 
So the real problem is not my perspective that I've proposed as a solution to the problem. The real problem is the thing that I've actually been criticizing. But let's, let's continue. Fells into a bit of a corner, e even if not, even if they could sort of reason themselves out of that knot, um, rhetorically, they're going to be cornered. Yeah, and I think that Lofton's position, and you'll see him articulate it, um, I, I think he, uh, the logical conclusion of his position is really what's what's going to uh, uh, cement what you just said uh, the most. I, I think because he's has he admits that he's been going in a trajectory over the past year or so of of, of becoming more and more and more hesitant to uh, allow for certain uh, circumstances under which a Catholic might withhold his assent from a papal teaching. Mm, I don't know if that's entirely accurate. Let me hold on. Let me block this uh, ridiculousness coming up in the chat. Why, why is it that I get spammed every stream? Wow. Um, no, I, I think what I've been saying in my videos is that um, I've become more hesitant to criticize the Pope um, because I noticed that in many cases, um, you know, if, if you give them the benefit of the doubt or if you consider this or that, then, you know, there, there isn't an issue. So, um, in other words, I've been, I've been less quick to rashly judge the Pope. And I think that that's a good thing. Um, however, I'm, I'm still willing to criticize the Pope when criticism is due and it's necessary and it's prudent and things like that. And it's being done charitably. Um, but it sounds like classical theists is, is thinking that I'm, I'm changing my perspective on assent to merely authentic uh, teachings. I, I think that there has been some tweaking to my thought here, but I, I, I wouldn't say it's really essential to, to my perspective. Um, but I'll, I'll further clarify that here in just a moment. Here he's going to explain what my perspective is in his mind, and I'm going to demonstrate why that's not my view. Uh, and he's eventually going to go on to say that, I mean, I'll just say his position, and we'll go on to play it, but his position seems to be now that um, what, what he calls, and, and what is correctly called, you know, the, the non-definitive magisterium of the church, the, the, what's also called like the merely authentic magisterium of the church or the merely authoritative teaching of the church. That's not infallible. He's going to go on to say that it may not be protected from error, but it would undermine the indefectibility of the church if there were ever a circumstance in which a pope taught something, however however uh, low uh, ranking in his magisterium, that contradicted the definitive teaching of the church. So he's No. And, and so right there, I'm going to have to say this is the fundamental misunderstanding of my perspective that is going to make the the rest of the video irrelevant for me to review because, again, a small mistake in the beginning is going to lead to all kinds of problems later on. Uh, so I, I don't expect there to be a, a proper engagement with my actual perspective when it's already misunderstood. Um, now, I can kind of understand why somebody might, might think that if they haven't really uh, listened to a whole lot of my content or something like that. But I, I think that I've been clear enough as far as putting out what my perspective is if, if you've watched a handful of my videos in the Magisterium playlist. But maybe I haven't. Maybe I haven't been. Maybe I haven't been clear enough. Uh, I'm going to rewind that, and I'm going to play it again, and then I'm going to explain my view. But again, I'm going to assume at this moment it's just that I've been unclear. I thought that I've been clear enough on what my view is. Maybe I haven't. I can kind of understand why somebody might watch one of my videos and, and come to that conclusion because maybe I'm not giving literally every every caveat or something like that in a video. But that is not my perspective. Let me walk through it again and I'll pause it and I'll, I'll then explain what my uh, perspective is. I, I mean, I'll just say his position and we'll go on to play it, but his position seems to be now that uh, what, what he calls, and, and what is correctly called, you know, the, the non-definitive magisterium of the church. And notice we're talking about the, the merely authentic magisterium, non-definitive teachings here. Uh, we're, we're in the, the, the ballpark, you know, we're, we're in the right area. 
Uh, that's correct. I am I am identifying uh, the issue that we're discussing today and a lot of these issues related to Pope Francis and others is is you know, in relation to non-definitive teachings. That, that's what my dissertation is on. Um, because I think that definitive teachings have has, has kind of been sufficiently addressed already since Vatican I. Um, but, you know, the non-definitive teachings and the merely authentic magisterium, um, we need some more work there. The church has done some basic work here where it's outlined its perspective in seed form, but I really do want to see the magisterium unpack it further as I've um, already noted. Um, so, so far, so good. We're, we're correct here in identifying the non-definitive magisterium, but you'll see where we, we go off the rails here in a moment. The, the What's also called like the merely authentic magisterium of the church or the merely authoritative teaching of the church that's not infallible. He's going to go on to say that it may not be protected from error. And, and that I also agree with. That is also accurate. That is my perspective. I want to make that very clear for everybody. I do believe that uh, there is such a thing as the non-definitive um, or the merely authentic magisterium or non-definitive teachings. And as I've argued before, as soon as you say non-definitive, you've admitted that there could be error in the magisterium, not in its definitive teachings, but in its non-definitive teachings. Otherwise, everything would be definitive. So just to even use the term non-definitive, you've already admitted that there could be some kind of error in the proposition itself. So we're not talking about just the language that's used. We're talking about a propositional error. That's the specific kind that I'm, I'm conceding. There could be such a thing. Now, has there been one? That's a different question. Um, that's certainly what I'm dealing with in, in, in my... Um, dissertation and, and much more to come as I, I continue to work through it. But I already concede that there could be one, theoretically, at the very least, since we call it non-definitive. Otherwise, it would be definitive. And that would literally mean everything that's magisterial would be infallible, <laughs> which is absurd, right? I mean, you would have to say everything that's taught in any encyclical or something like that is is, is somehow infallible. Uh, that's an absurd decision. Um, so, so far, so good. It's the next part where I think uh, classical theists has, has somehow misunderstood my view. But it would undermine the indefectibility of the church if there were... Notice indefectibility is now what we're talking about. ...ever circumstance in which a pope taught something, however, however uh, low uh, ranking in his magisterium, that contradicted the definitive teaching of the church. So he that is not my perspective. And I'm going to play that again, but let me explain what my perspective is, and then we'll, we'll play through it again. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that that's a tenable position. The way they, they just articulated my perspective, I don't think that that's tenable. This notion that you could say, um, you know, if you had the Pope contradicting a definitive teaching in his non-definitive magisterium, that will go against the indefectibility of the church. That's never been my perspective, never. I have video after video after video actually saying that, um, uh, you, you know, prior prior to the the development of, of some of my views here, I have videos where I've been very clear about how even if you do have, let's say, heresy and the non-definitive teachings of the church or merely authentic uh, teachings of the church um, that goes against the dogma, um, you know, to which one do you owe assent? And the very fact that I'm asking to which one you owe assent means that I recognize that it doesn't go against the indefectibility of the church because we're still sticking around to weigh these things and determine which one I give assent to. Um, so there's no way that anybody could interpret me, I think, if they've really listened to my the, the rest of my videos. Um, but, okay, if you had, let's say you hypothetically have this situation. I don't grant that this could happen, and I'm going to explain why here in a moment. But let's just grant for the moment that it could happen. Okay, let's say that you do have a pope who teaches heresy in his magisterium. And here when I say in his magisterium, lest I be misunderstood, I'm not talking about as a private individual. And I'm also obviously not talking about something ex-cathedra either. I'm talking about also 
let me also clarify further. I'm not talking about as, as something lower than his universal magisterium, where he's teaching as the local bishop of Rome or something like that, or the patriarch of the West, merely the patriarch of the West. I would say that that's, that's lower than his universal magisterium. Um, if we're talking about merely as the patriarch of the West or merely as the bishop of Rome, um, that's lower than his universal um, office as, as universal pastor. So I'm not talking about in those, those situations. I'm, I'm specifically talking about in his universal magisterium as, as the universal pastor, you know, teaching the whole flock, the whole people of God. Um, if he were to teach heresy non-definitively, uh, so he's going against the dogma, or he were to teach an error in Catholic doctrine, so he were to teach something that's contrary to definitive Catholic doctrine, because it's not just limited to heresy here. I would also say, even if he teaches something that's contrary to definitive Catholic doctrine, um, that would not immediately go against the indefectibility of the church. That would not immediately go. Um, and, and if you were to have this case, as I've argued many, 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 many times, you would give your assent to the definitive teaching or the dogmatic teaching, not to the error or heresy of the Pope and his merely authentic magisterium. Your assent would actually have to go to the one with a higher weight. So anytime I've ever spoken about weighing magisterial propositions, I'll usually note that your, your assent will go to the one with a higher weight. So if you have a contradiction in the magisterium, how, how do you know which one you're supposed to give assent to? You give assent to the one with the higher weight. Well, obviously something that's definitive or dogmatic um, is going to outweigh something that's non-definitive. So you would automatically give your assent to the one that is definitive. So if this situation were to happen, and I'm going to tell you why I don't think it will happen, but let's say I'm wrong. Let's say it could ha actually happen. That's fine. That doesn't take away from my ultimate thesis because I've already explained that if this were true and if this were to happen, you would simply assent to the definitive teaching. So no indefectibility, no faith crisis, no, oh, you got to leave the church now and I'm putting people in a position that they're vulnerable to have this faith crisis. That's not my perspective. I've already spoken about what would happen if this were to happen. You would give assent to the definitive teaching and you would not have to give assent to the non-definitive teaching. Um, the reason why I don't believe this will happen and again, if I'm wrong in what I'm about to say, that's fine. I just told you what, here's what you're to do if that were to happen. I just gave you the backup plan that doesn't break the indefectibility of the church. I don't believe that that will happen or could happen because you do have language by the magisterium itself that seems to indicate, seems to indicate, and I want to argue it strongly seems to indicate and many theologians have understood it to indicate that um, the church's magisterium as a whole, including its non-definitive teachings, is protected by the Holy Spirit. And so the question that I've asked people is, okay, well, if that's accurate, if the Holy Spirit actually is protecting the magisterium as a whole, if, if we're properly understanding what's being said here, um, how can we speak of protection of, by the Holy Spirit for erroneous teachings? How, how do, it can't be a protection of the proposition because the proposition is in error. So what have I said? I've argued for the safety of these teachings, you know, based upon the work of some preconciliarists. Um. And again, it's just bolstered further with Dona Veritatis. Um, again, if I'm wrong on this, okay, that's fine. I just gave you the backup plan that doesn't break into effectability of the church. And so you're not going to have this faith crisis. But here's why I don't think that that would happen. And I would like to see some interaction with it. I'd like to see somebody prove or disprove this thesis and say that, no, there isn't this notion of a safety, which I'm going to explain again in a second here of what I mean by that. But I would like to see some interaction there.
But again, at the end, at the end of the day, if somebody can disprove it, that's fine. No sweat off my back. I just gave you the alternative solution. Um, what do I mean here by a safety? Well, again, if we speak of the protection of the Holy Spirit for the integral mission of the magisterium, uh, in what way can we speak of the protection of the Holy Spirit for non-definitive teachings? It can't be that the Holy Spirit protects the proposition from being an error. Otherwise, everything would be definitive. That doesn't make sense. And we've already recognized that there is um, a non-definitive uh, magisterium. So I've, I've put forward the view, and again, it's not unique to me, but that the Holy Spirit would protect it from being so erroneous that if one were to give religious assent of intellect and will to it, that they would be led off the path of salvation. That is what I've said. Um, so again, if I'm wrong there, that's fine. I just give you the backup solution. You go, you give your uh, assent to the definitive teaching and not to the non-definitive teaching. And that would not automatically go against the indefectibility of the church. I wonder if maybe the misunderstanding is from the only time I ever have spoken of the indefectibility of the church here. Um, and I, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to, I'm willing to revise this view if somebody can show me, okay, this wouldn't immediately go against the indefectibility of the church. Um, but if somebody, but I have spoken about how if you have a universal discipline that touches on the sacraments or something that is essential to the church's mission, which the sacraments would be one, um, if you were, were to have a universal discipline that were harmful to souls, and by harmful to souls, one means here that if you were to participate in this, you would go to hell. You would be led off the path of salvation. I say the church couldn't have such a thing because that would go against the indefectibility of the church. And I argue that based on figures like uh, Father, Father Barry, among others. And I know I've done some videos here already on this. I'm not going to further explicate any of these things, but maybe if somebody could show me how that wouldn't somehow invalidate the indefectibility of the church, that's fine. But I don't see how it wouldn't be because there's plenty of evidence out there. And I think we also know by reason that if the church is no longer carrying out its essential mission and something that's essential to its, its constitution or its purpose, then then it's no longer really fully the church it's it's in some way defected from its essential mission um so something like vital to the sacraments i don't think that the church could impose a discipline that completely radically alters the sacraments so for example could could the church like universally promulgate a discipline that says you have to use doritos instead of bread for the eucharist i don't think so and here the reason why is if it were to say you have to use Doritos as the matter for the Eucharist, I don't think you would have transubstantiation. Um, and if you don't have transubstantiation, can you really say that the church is carrying out its mission in, in, in the world today in preserving the sacraments in every age? I don't think you can say that if it's no longer offering valid, you know, universally um, a valid Eucharist. So whatever problems that we can have with the discipline of the church, it can't be on that level. Um, that is a thesis I've defended, and that's the only time I've ever spoken about indefectibility to my recollection. Um, but I'm willing to hear if somebody can say, well, no, here's how you could still have Doritos for the Eucharist universally, and the church is still carrying out its sacramental mission. I mean, good luck with that one, but okay, if you can somehow... Show me that one. All right, fine. I'll, I'll hear you out. It doesn't completely overturn anything that I've really argued in this video or any other video. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm just sitting here trying to think, like, how could somebody maybe misunderstand it? Maybe that's what it is. Um, or it's just that I haven't been clear enough in every video. That's, that's fair also. Um, so... Full, bringing it back full circle here. Um, well, let me add one more thing before we come back full circle. 
Um, to what extent can the magisterium err non-definitively? I do want to speak a little bit more about that. Um, as far as if we have this idea of the Holy Spirit protecting the merely authentic magisterium, I would argue it pertains to um, anything that would probably fall under a major censor, a major theological censor. Um, but maybe somebody could argue that, okay, some of the major censors you could assent to and you're, you wouldn't lose salvation or something like that. It wouldn't be harmful to your soul. Okay, maybe. But I think if you were to assent to something that's heretical or an error um, against a definitive Catholic teaching, I, I sure think that you're putting your soul in peril. So I, I definitely want to say that the, the Holy Spirit would protect that extent of error in the merely authentic magisterium. Um, but even if I'm wrong there, I've already set people up with a backup plan to explain, here's what would happen. Even if I'm wrong there, you would merely give assent, you would give assent to the uh, definitive teaching and not the non-definitive teaching. And that doesn't, again, automatically go against the indefectibility of the church. We would have to here reduce our understanding of the indefectibility of the church uh, to its definitive teachings only, which is a very common view today. A lot of people will argue that, you know, when it comes to the indefectibility of the teaching mission of the church, it's reduced to definitive teachings only. Um, that could be true, but I don't think it's true because of I, I see other evidence suggesting that the Holy Spirit is protecting even non-definitive teachings, not as far as them being free from an erroneous proposition, but being free from being so egregiously erroneous that if one were to assent to them, they would be led off the path of salvation. So that is what my view is. So if we go back and listen to what um, classical theist expresses as my view, you'll 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 hear where it's 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 completely wrong at the very last part. If there were ever a circumstance in which a pope taught something, however however uh, low. Uh, ranking in his magisterium that contradicted the definitive teaching of the church. However, low ranking is also not necessarily the case because when you say low ranking, are, are we talking about just like the you know the theological notes that are relate to teachings and and are the major theological notes? What what do you mean by however low ranking? So the Pope couldn't ever. In his mind, he's saying that I think the Pope couldn't ever say something that's offensive to pious ears. That's not my view. I, I think that in even in the authentic magisterium, in light of everything I've just said, I actually think that the Pope could say something that's offensive to pious ears in his magisterium as a universal pontiff. I think that's possible because something that's offensive to pious ears is technically not theologically untrue. Something could be true and still offensive to pious ears. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not going to say that you couldn't have any of the minor censors, you know, creep into the merely authentic magisterium. That, that's not my view. So when he says, however low, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, what, what do we mean? Are we just talking about within the, the major theological notes? Um, but again, that that isn't my perspective anyway, because again, if I've, I'm wrong about how I'm understanding the integral mission of the whole, of the church being protected by the Holy Spirit as far as a theological safety, even if I'm wrong there, I already have the backup view that um, the indefectibility of the church and its teaching mission would be limited only to definitive teachings. And if you have a non-definitive teaching contradicting a definitive teaching, you would assent to the definitive teaching. So... In light of that information, in light of me clarifying uh, my perspective, hopefully uh, that, that helps and we can have um, a good uh, theological discussion. Uh, so like I said, I'll, I'll see if I can get uh, classical theists on and we'll, we'll have a discussion. And any further concerns about my perspective, we can, we can have a discussion about. But I've already kind of thought of, you know, what if I'm wrong about this? Well, here then it's this. And what about this? And then this. I've, I've already thought about these things, and I've outlined a great deal of it already in my videos. But in fairness, 
you'd have to be a habitual viewer of, you know, reason and theology to pick up on probably some of this stuff. And I understand that not everybody, you know, watches everything that I put out or something. So I, I understand how it, uh, my view could be misunderstood, but you'll notice I just spent about 30 minutes um, really qualifying my view. And that's just a very basic uh, qualification to it. Obviously there would be further clarifications and qualifications that I would offer for, for further pushback. And so much, much, much more could be said. Uh, but hopefully, again, that helps uh, clarify my view. All right. Well, I appreciate y'all watching. I'll probably be back for another show here at 6 p.m. Central a little bit later on. So y'all y'all stick around. If uh, if y'all have any questions or Q&As, I'll probably do just an open forum or something like that. Like that. So just ask me anything. Uh, then, but I, I have to head out here uh, in just a moment. So I'll just, I'll come back. And if y'all have any questions about what I'm saying here, or classical theists, if you have questions or something like that, uh, just uh, just hit me up in the, the video that I'll do uh, most likely later, probably around 5 6, 6 p.m. Central, somewhere around there. All righty, I have to head out, but I'll, I'll be back in a little bit. See you later. God bless. Oh, wait, oh, wait before, before you go, you... I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.